Nova Chen, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Hi, uh, it's great to be here again. <laughs> it's an honor to have you, man. It's, it's a real treat. Yeah. Uh, Sky, let's see, we're recording this on a Tuesday. Sky is releasing on iOS on Thursday. How are you feeling? How are you feeling two days before the launch of this game? Uh, I'm still noodling some of the shots, you know, some, some final editing, some cuts. Yeah, just uh, procrastinating. Also feeling <laughs> nervous. Yeah. Nervous? Do you feel like you're you're much less nervous when you are actually working on things like a launch trailer and things? You're trying to find things to, to take up your mind here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I care a lot more about what's in the game. So the stuff I'm working on is still happening in the game. And this is also the first game that uh, I've ever worked on where you can actually continuously update it. You know, where in the old games on console, you release it and it's it's gone. You know, the, the kid's out of your house. You know, you, <laughs> you can't do anything to it. Um, so it is somewhat of a weird situation where you can do a day one, day one patch if you want to. Right. Do you have a roadmap ready to go at this point or are you going to be fully flexible mm -hmm. and see what the feedback is first? Uh, we have a roadmap of, you know, uh, a bunch of features we want to add to the game. And, you know, uh, there will be different seasons. Uh, there's actually a lot of content we have to work on. Um, so, so yeah, we, we say, well, if you can't fix it this build, fix it next season or something like that. Uh, yeah. So you, you say you're nervous uh, about the upcoming launch. What are you nervous about? What are you, what are you scared of uh, with the launch of Sky here? Mm, well, when we made PlayStation games, uh, the focus was uh, very singular, which is we want to shock you with something you've never experienced before, you know, making magic. Uh, uh, you know, whether it's flower or journey, there's a very strong emotional goal that we want to achieve. Uh, but this is this is the first time you know we we become independent. Uh, not only do we want to make a game that can touch you, but also we want to prove that artistic games have a market on the uh, you know kind of the the biggest gaming platform today, the mobile market. Um, and because of that, we also have to adopt into the free to start. Uh, business model, which is there's, you know, a business model we also want to uh, prove that could work with an emotional game. Because uh, when we think about a movie, imagine uh, the movie doesn't charge you anything and then somewhere in the middle of a movie, <laughs> they ask you for money. Um, and that's just weird, right? <laughs> so it took us a long time to not, to, not just to make a game, but also to uh, essentially embrace the limitation of mobile platform, uh, but also take advantage of what mobile platform can do that the console game couldn't do. Um, and then tackle with the free to play uh, business and ecosystem. So there's a lot of things going on. Here. There's so much going on. There's so much to unpack. Uh, we've been playing yeah. a little bit of it. My coworker, Matt Miller, has, has poured a uh -huh. ton of time into it. And he, he's fascinated by it. And it is just uh -huh. playing at least the opening section. It's such a bizarre uh -huh. blend. And I'm trying to wrap my mind around it still about like, it starts out and it's like, oh, this feels a lot more like Journey than even uh -huh. I was expecting. And then it yeah. starts layering in systems. It's like, oh, they're kind of gamifying and, uh, you know, mobilifying the journey experience and it's a weird uh, mesh that I didn't fully see coming. Is that uh -huh. because that's where your sense of game design is going or is it just, hey, we have to deal with the mobile market and what people are willing to fund and what investors will back and this is the type of game we need to make? I think initially when we set out to do uh, a right after journey, it was relatively straightforward, which is we want to take an emotional experience to put on the mobile phone, where suddenly 10 out of nine, what well, nine out of 10 people who play games on the phone have never touched a console game in the past. And their impression of games, of, of what the game industry is, was limited to what are the mobile games. And we just thought it would be great to uh, share some of the most, you know, cutting edge designs, you know, technologies, you know, music production, you know, a high high production value game 
with uh, a bunch of newcomers to the gaming uh, gaming world. Um, and for the first four years when we worked on it, you know, we were we just think it's going to be a title we would sell upfront, you know, like uh, uh, Infinity Blade, you know, back in 2014. Um, but then very quickly the market shifted. Uh, there's a flood of free games, right, to the point that the trust we built between console developer and uh, gamers over the past 30 years no longer applies, right? Because you have all these people who have never had the trust uh, towards a game developer. And suddenly there's a game that costs three bucks and there's the same game that looking even better that's free, right? So yeah. why would anybody pay any dollar to any games on the phone? Um, and that's the point where we're competing with, you know, everyone who's trying to lower in their uh, initial entry barriers. Um, so, so that is kind of like a big pivot in the middle of uh, the development. Essentially, we made two games. We made a game that would having, uh, I would call it the sequel to Journey um, as a linear experience. Uh, but then the market changed completely where nobody wants to buy any game on the phone. And then we have to change the game so that you can start playing for free. But you know, essentially pay us later. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to change the game quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's such a gorgeous looking game. I feel like mm -hmm. when it eventually comes to consoles, if it comes to PC, it is coming to mm -hmm. other platforms, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's capable of coming to anything, right? <laughs> it's just like where it, it, you know, naturally fits the best. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. is it going to be the same version as uh, like the free to play version on mobile then? Or can you mm -hmm. pivot back to that other game that you say that you built and kind of strip out currencies and things like that? No. So what, what, what happened is we built the premium game as a roller coaster ride. Uh, but now in order to allow people to come in and, you know, uh, build a society, a community here, uh, we changed the roller coaster ride into a theme park. Uh, okay. You know, essentially, you can kind of hang out in the theme park where the roller coaster ride story is still there. You know, if you want to experience it. Um, so we're building just something much more massive, right? Uh, if you want to go scout every single land uh, and find all the secrets, um, it'll take you a long time to play. I mean, I, I never thought I would be making a game beyond two hour long because all, all my past game was like a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that, you know, if you can touch someone with lesser time, you should do that because that's respecting people's uh, time. Um, but as we expand in the roller coaster ride into the theme park, we, we start to notice people make friends here people form community, uh, people start to use the game as a kind of a virtual chat room. <laughs> uh, and they're just hanging out here. Um, and then we realized that the people who stayed here want things to do. You know, they, they don't just want to play a game and see a story and they just uh, have nothing else to do. So, so yeah, it's a uh, I would say that the project that definitely had two phases, right? The yeah. storytelling phase and then the theme park phase. Does the so does the theme park phase does some of that influence come from like talking to potential investors now that you're independent and just trying to figure out where the money's gonna come from to continue development? Mm -hmm. Are you having those discussions with investors of like, can you make this into a living game type of thing? No, it's actually the reverse. I, I'm a biggest fan uh, from Pixar and Disney, and I always wanted to build an uh, online world, a uh, MMO game, which is a virtual theme park. Um, I just didn't know this project will get me all the way over there. <laughs> I just thought, you know, Journey was the first uh, two-player game, one on one, right? So this one will be the small step forward, which will be an eight-player at a time. Uh, but now as the project grow, uh, it st the server start to support more people and the content start to expand. I'm actually like getting to a point where I can say this is a pseudo MMO game. Uh, so the other thing about Disneyland, what I like about is 
I always wanted to, you know, we grew up with games. Games shaped our life, shaped our views, shaped our friendship, you know, shaped our social lives. And uh, I, I, I love the media because it, it, to me it's like, a, it's a friend that I grew up with. Uh, as I grew up, uh, a lot of my, you know, real life friends moved on. You know, they say, hey, you know, games are just taking too much time. Uh, I don't have time for an 80 hour grind just to see a story, right? Which is exactly why I'm making these emotional games in less than two hours because adults are busy. Yeah. You know, and uh, I want to make game relevant to my friends who grew up with games but now don't have time. Um, and then very quickly, uh, you know, after we made Flower Journey, the smartphone penetrated everybody's pocket. Suddenly, all these friends who don't have time to play a game now are playing like, you know, Clash Royale or Candy Crush. They, mm-hmm. But they still don't call themselves gamers. You know, their, their view towards the game is it was a childhood thing. You know, it's for kids. Um, and so that's why we were looking to these emotional experiences that are still relevant to adults, you know. Yeah. Um, and Journey t- typically is... I would consider in terms of uh, emotional complexity, it's more like a uh, drama, uh, which tend to be more favored by older people and the younger people like more kind of a direct, uh, straightforward emotion like action, you know, like uh, adventure or like horror. Uh, But as you grow older, you prefer a a more mixed, mixed kind of cocktail of emotions like comedy you know like you don't laugh if someone scare you but if someone scare you but then they cuddle you then you you kind of laugh right uh you have to mix emotion together and for drama it's a roller coaster ride of feelings and we can give you a a cathartic uh kind of a moment where you can even adults can shed a tear of joy right um and so, so that's what I've been focusing on, you know, just how can I make games still relevant to the people around me? Right? How- I can make the game respected by, uh, uh, you know, like, like older societies. Yeah. Um, and so when I set out to do the project after Journey, I was thinking, okay, you know, the only way to make the society to respect games is by making games that is actually enjoyable and and, uh, uh, you know, valuable, appreciable uh, towards different groups of, uh, you know, genders or ages, right? And I thought about all the games that I can make. You know, right now, game industry is very left-handed. You know, pretty much any emotion you find that's popular in the uh, film industry, that's popular about amongst men, has all become very well-saturated red ocean in the game market. For example, male uh, film market tend to lean towards action and adventure, sci-fi, horror, thriller, uh, documentary. Um, Documentary is particularly more interesting to older men, right? So younger men, uh, everything you can see in film is already turning into a video game. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you think about children, you think about women, you know, and older adults, the, the popular movie genres are like romantic comedy. Uh, I don't think there's a game equivalent of romantic comedy today. Tough, uh, yeah. Yeah, and for example, uh, you know, romance, you know, like Twilight. Uh, you know, that equivalent of uh, uh, simulation of being uh, loved by a hot guy or multiple hot guys uh, is a very new and you know foreign land in the game industry uh, so sky, recently oh. in asia there are some games that start to uh kind of become very popular uh it's like dating simulator for teenage girls uh, and they were very very popular uh but anyway i, I want to come back to say that i felt like we can try to tap into all these new markets the new emotional experiences to you know bring more people into playing games and making them love the, the medium and I thought out of all the emotions, I, I personally find that equivalent emotion of a Disneyland or a, a Disney or Pixar movie um, is still vacant in the game industry. Um, so 
there are, there are a lot of uh, Saturday morning cartoon equivalent for games. Like they are the uh, child friendly games. You know, you can you can play uh, you know Lego Star Wars. You can play Club Penguin uh, and Minecraft to some extent, right? But you're not gonna expect that for a dad who would play with their kid uh, in you know let's say uh, Club Penguin. He's gonna find something emotional that's gonna have a joyful tear uh, in his eye, you know, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and even for a game where a boyfriend and girlfriend can play together, it's very rare because the games are either swing really, really left or really, really right. You know, there isn't a lot of games that is uh, truly attractive to, to both gender uh, or cross uh, generation. Um, so that's why I, I thought if we could bring a whole family together to play games uh, and cr- provide the bonding experience that Journey provides, you know, like y- y- after you're playing it, you feel you're closer to someone, um, then that value can be really translated into respect. I think if, yeah. if a family find it bonding the, the people they love together, they can say, I can see why games could be, um, you know, the ninth form of art. Our games can be, uh, you know, positive besides being all the, you know, what the press has been talking about, you know, uh, right, right. Gun, sports, guns, and competitions. Right, yeah, and, for sure. And uh, and somewhat of a gambling with <laughs> all these uh, mobile game surprise mechanics. Right? Yes, the surprise mechanics. Uh, Is it tough? Yeah. I remember, like, the long development of Journey. I remember... God, I remember hearing an interview with you on the PlayStation Blogcast, I think, in like the early days of that podcast, before Journey came out. And it, was, it sounded insane to me with you just saying, oh, I want to create a game that feels like a Team Eco game. And I remember mm-hmm. just listening to that and be like, good luck. No one that can call that shot is going to land anywhere near it. And the team pulled it off, so congratulations to you. <laughs> but it was funny yes. hearing you on that, in that interview talk about, you know, kind of being lost in the journey no pun intended, of development itself. And you could go mm-hmm. so many different directions. I remember you were debating whether or not to just make it motion controlled for a long time there. Mm-hmm. So can you compare being lost in the development wilderness of Journey versus Sky? Does Sky just feel like, because it literally <laughs> is about two and a half times as, uh, as yeah, deep, yes. confusing? Uh, Journey was three years of lost. And at the end of Journey, we were like, we don't want to ever spend three years to make a game <laughs> ever. <laughs> we want to spend seven. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, yeah. Sky. Sky is is more like there's double double lost, right? The first is we need to nail that emotion. The second is the market is shifting and the business is shifting. Um, one of the biggest challenge that the time we put in is we were innovating the games initially, but then we were told that we have to use free to play. Uh, a uh, business model where everything people point me to look at is filled with kind of uh, aggressive tactics, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and we are a game designer, so I'm super sensitive about how people design their payment system. It's just like very obvious, you know. If you tell me buy one get one free, you know, you're you're trying to obscure my sense of how much price really is and makes me feel greedy. Uh, if you say this is a limited deal, you know, if you don't take it next week, it's gone. Then there's a fear of missing out. Right. And if you show me, Oh, my friend is doing pretty well, you know, it's a sense of potential competition or jealousy. And if you, um, tell me when I'm gone, that the stuff I earned was stolen by someone else that I have to uh, pay to get it back or to get revenge, it, then it's somewhat of a hatred. So it's like, because w- w- through Journey, we know like a tiny amount of change in terms of what kind of feedback you provide will change people's views on each other. I still remember in Journey when people don't share the resources, uh, the little cost thing. People hated each other. They were like, I don't want to play with anybody because they're stealing my <laughs> money. Right. Um, and it's just that, you know, it's just a tiny little thing. 
you people would behave completely different. And so when I'm aspired to create an emotional experience to bond the family together, and then people are telling me to do gotcha, you know, uh, it just doesn't work. You know, how would you feel as a parent to go to a Disneyland and then kids are pulling these, uh, you know, surprise mechanics, you know? Well, I guess it does happen in real life. <laughs> but I understand the complicated emotion. It's a weird thing, though, because the, the contract of Sky is trying to convey that emotional experience while also, you know, trying to teach people about currencies. And I think for a lot of mm-hmm. people, that immediately is just a red flag of, all right, mm-hmm. uh, the lights have come on in the museum or the movie theater, and now I have to stop and use a different part of my brain entirely. Like, that must be so yes. difficult to get that right balance of systems versus emotion mm-hmm. and art and beauty. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, even when we were developing on PlayStation for Flower and Journey, having your trophy icon to pop up yes. was a huge disturbing thing. So we were always trying to delay it until you're like back to the menu or after all the things over, then we show you a notification. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is, this seven years, I spent a lot of time doing research and I learned a lot. I mean, if, if there's anything like, I learned a lot of, about you know commerce designs and even just like notification like you have a mobile phone right what do you notify people when do you notify people yeah. how often do you notify people oh it God. was it was like not really a constraint for us to tackle on a playstation um oh. although right now even playstation start to have all these social media features the, the entire world is moving towards this future where, you know, we are never going to be just watching a TV without another screen going on at the same time, right? Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like embracing that frontier is kind of exciting. So are you fully prepared for, I mean, is the console version of Sky going to be free to play then for every console? Mm, this, I would say probably not completely free because, I mean, it's it's a lot of money to make this game, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, certainly the console version will have a, a lot more uh, rich and high definition uh, graphics uh, and feedbacks because, you know, on a phone, you're battling with, yeah, I guess the biggest thing I learned between mobile development and console is on console, you want to maximize the usage of power Right, it's, you want to take every single computing you can get from the hardware to give player joy and, and magic. Where on the phone, you kind of have to reserve it because you want the phone to be not too hot where your hands get sweaty. Right. Uh, and then you want the phone to last a bit longer so they can finish playing with somebody <laughs> rather than say, hey, you know what, I, I, I need to reserve my battery, right? I need to. Yeah plug in somewhere or if someone's like in the airport wanting to play the game but if the battery is only 30 percent he's like oh i don't know if i should be playing what if i run out of battery right during the flight um all kinds of concerns so so yeah for for a mobile game we can't really push to uh the extreme on how much we're using the computing power yeah, you, you mentioned, yeah, it costs a lot of money to, to make this game. You've been working on it for a long time. Are you committed to that game company staying indie going into the future? I imagine companies like Microsoft have knocked on your door, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we, we might be uh, partnering with someone to help us promoting the uh, console version of the game, but oh, essentially okay. the development cost, we paid all the development costs. So uh, it's really depending on how whether we can find the right uh, partner or in the end, we could also self-publish. Yeah. Uh, we're figuring that out right now. Okay. But you're committed to that game company staying independent as a studio moving into the future? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. The, um, I got to ask, the, it's fascinating seeing that game company's catalog of PlayStation games being released on the Epic Game Store and just PC in general. Mm-hmm. I guess everybody's just assumed that Sony owned those. Can you talk about that? relationship how that works yeah yeah sony own a hundred percent of those games ip um and for a very long time we were not allowed to bring the game to anywhere uh outside playstation um it it's you know seven years after journey came out 
um, we took a, a lot of uh, communication back and forth with the Sony executives. You know, I mean, it's it was game of the year in 2013, so they treated very differently than you know other games that would have been ported to other platforms. Um, but we all agree that we felt a game like this deserved to be played by more people. Um, and it doesn't seem to age much uh, since the subject uh, is very universal. And so Sony made the exception for us to launch it on PC uh, because, you know, it's not a direct competitor uh, with Sony. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that also with Quantic Dream, they also allowed them to to put their mm -hmm. games on PC. Do you see Sony overall as kind of warming up to the PC market? Mm, that I don't know. I felt like it's more like they they understand we as a developer uh, could have uh, made more profit if we could have launched on other platforms. And for a very long time, it was limited to uh, one platform only. And, you know, I think it's more like they want to uh, treat us nicely for us to find an alternative uh, uh, place to, you know, sell games and reach more people. Yeah, yeah it's both. It's both money and awareness. Yeah, with with Sky in general, um, how proud are you feeling about the project? Uh, what, what's your what's your level mm -hmm. of pride for this one? Uh, well, so uh, a lot of people ask me how I think about all my games. They were like, oh, is Sky better than Journey? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Yeah, it's like you're asking, you, you know, if you have two kids, like you're, you're comparing the two, how do you compare them, right? So I said, uh, so uh, so Journey was, uh, so, sorry, uh, Flower is the most personal game. It's my favorite game because it's, it's, it's about my life. Uh, Journey is certainly the uh, most well-known game, right? Uh, but Sky is the most ambitious and the biggest budget game. <laughs> you know? Are you feeling good about that? Uh-huh. Oh, sweet. Yeah. What's, what's like the ideal takeaway? It, when players get their hands on, on Sky, what's, what kind of reactions are you hoping for here? Um, I really see Sky as a tool uh, for gamers who love games to share with their friends and family who might have like a second guess about what gaming is uh, and, and bring them into experiencing games and hopefully loving games. Uh, that's really the, the reason I, I made Sky and I put it on the phone because nobody's gonna buy a second PlayStation to play Journey with you, <laughs> right? Try to convince any of your family member to buy a PlayStation. Impossible. Right, right? So, so I wanted to lower the barrier so they already have a mobile device or maybe in the future a laptop or something that you could you could say, hey, you know, uh, let's let's go have an adventure in this magical land, right? And before there would be all kinds of excuses, right? But now it's like, here, let me just download it for you. <laughs> Boom, that's the game. Here, I'm here. Let's go, right? <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I wanted to make that barrier as low as possible, but at the same time to provide a family-friendly experience. You know, there's no killing here, there's no sex or gambling here, and it's something that you should be feel proud to show your family. And don't you know, nothing shameful about this. You know, there's there's nothing. Yeah, it's it's really hard. I mean, it's so easy to sell something using the. The, what I was saying earlier, you know, we know sex sells, you know, it even works in Hollywood. We know gambling sells, right? And we wanted to do something that doesn't rely on that, right? So that we can earn respect and love uh, to, to, to the game industry. That's, that's what Sky is for. That's, that's a hell of a mission, man. Uh, so mm. other than Sky, uh, what have you been playing lately? What, what games have you been uh, keeping busy with? Uh, I've been playing mostly actually mobile games lately. Really? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, not even the, the like super successful ones. Like I'm, I'm playing the remake of uh, Command and Conquer on a mobile version. Oh no! Yeah. Really? I feel like the yeah. internet is wincing hearing you say that. Like, what have you become, yeah. man? 
<laughs> yeah, it's like I, I, I used to play uh, boba, but then as I grow older, I have kids now, right? The time for a MOBA was like 45 minutes to an hour. And if you lose a game and you have to play it again until you win, right? The, the, the interval is too, too long. Like if I play two MOBA games, that's two hours. That's pretty much gone. That's like nuts. imagine the kids and my wife are going to be very angry at me. <laughs> I'd imagine auto chess right. falls in that same camp for you then? Right. So what happened is then I was switching to uh, Heroes of Storms, which is like uh, 15 to 20 minutes around. Uh, but then later I'm switching to like something that's even shorter, like two to five minutes around, right? And which is like the Clash of Clan, uh, the Command and Conqueror uh, kind of game. Because, yeah, I mean, as we grow older and older, the time we have, I mean, if I want to play, I mean, I still play Dark Souls and, uh, you know, some of these like favorite games from old times, like, I certainly would play a Final Fantasy remake, right? <laughs> uh, but I have to like make it a special event. I have to like, you know, get excuse, you know, book up on my schedule to play those games, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, which is also kind of like as I was making Sky, I started to realize, man, you know, like, how can I still keep the game relevant even to myself, right? Like, which game would I play? Um, I could, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I, it's kind of crazy to think I'm close to 40 now. You know, it's just felt like yesterday when I graduated from college and how much life changes, you know. Um, I remember like maybe 15 years ago, we were saying the average gamer's age is like 35 years old. Does that make now the average gamer's age to become 50? <laughs> Uh, There's a lot of newcomers coming in, man. This Fortnite game, it's it's apparently quite good. I don't know. Right. So all it does it mean the people who go above 35 is basically not playing games anymore? Yeah, I don't know. You know? Yeah. That's, How old are you? Uh, 32. All right. You still got some years going there. Yeah, it's working uh, out. Yeah. So, all right, obviously uh -huh. Skype uh, completely crapped the bed there, but you're back. But the point is, it's tough to make time for for games these days. But I wanted to ask you, with the uh -huh. name with the name Genova, uh, what are your thoughts on the Final Fantasy VII remake? What are you hoping for from the Final Fantasy VII remake? I think it's more like how I felt towards Lion King remake. Oh no! Have you seen the Rotten <laughs> Tomato scores? <laughs> so I didn't see it because I I cherish the memory I had, and uh, I mean. Super realistic blanking does look very visually rich, but I just don't have the. I, I must, I'm scared that it will ruin my memory. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So I didn't watch it. I'm I'm trying to just wait until see people to tell me whether it's it's better or you know it's not worth watching. For Final Fantasy, I think it's gonna be the same. You know, I'm going to wait until all the, you know, everybody's going to be reviewing it. And if they tell us that, you know, it's the same, uh, you know, then I probably wouldn't play it. What did you think of, like, Advent Children? Do you feel like that tarnished your memory at all of the original game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> see, you, you, you know, this is the same thing people from Harry Potter or Game of Thrones, you know, that Sound of Ice and Fire, they will say the book is always better than the, the movie. Right. You know? And, yeah, but I, as a game developer, I'm quite curious to see, like, how many upgrades are they going to do to our experience from a different time, you know? It's and pretty that, wild. that's interesting to me. Yeah. Do you have any uh, hopes or do's and don'ts? If you could convey a message to Square right now, like what you want them to do with the, <laughs> with the creature, the, the entity of Genova versus what you don't want them to do? Yeah. So in the writing, uh, Genova doesn't have gender, uh, but in the original game, I think it does look like a mother, right? Mm -hmm. Looks like a female. Um, but, you know, I, I would certainly hope that they do. Uh, they 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 have a better design this time. <laughs> oh, you don't want the eye on the boob anymore, Genova? <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually don't remember that detail. Oh, okay. It was like, really low resolution back then. On the yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of had a lot of imagination 
you know, because back then the resolution is low. Um, and at, at the time when I played the game, I don't really speak very good English. So I played the English version. A lot of the dialogue I don't necessarily understand to its full. So like a lot of the experience was filled with my own imagination, you know. Interesting. Uh, but I guess the, the raw emotion of lost someone who you have, you know, uh, teamed up, uh, leveled up together, built up like a 20 to 30 hour of experience, you know, and eventually losing someone, that is uh, universal, uh, the sense of loss. Um, yeah, I, actually, I would say that if the character is more realistic, like if they have a good voice actor or actress, I would argue that people probably will feel less about the loss mm -hmm. because they know that was a, that, that is a fictional character. It's an actor or actress uh, versus someone who speaks not many, uh, not much, right? And then you project so much of yourself into it. It's like the, the girl from Michael, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, versus, I mean, the other one that's really well done is like uh, uh, Bioshock Infinite, right? You know, but I, I personally, I felt like I, I care less about losing her than losing the girl from Michael because it, I put a part of myself into the character. Mm -hmm. Where the character in the Bioshock is more like she's convenient, she's helpful, she's, you know, essentially a buff, right? Like I, I appreciate the buff, right? <laughs> uh, but losing the buff isn't losing a part of myself, you know? Yeah. So. I, I feel like maybe this time I will feel the same way towards, uh, you know, the Final Fantasy moment. Right, right. Do you, uh, has anybody from Square ever talked to you about your name? Has it ever come up? Like, what's the strangest place <laughs> where, where the name has come up? Uh, no, not really. Nobody really uh, from the company reached out to me. Why, why, why couldn't I name myself the Khaleesi, right? I mean, there's like, what, 500 people's name Khaleesi or something, right, from <laughs> Game of Thrones. Nobody's going to sue you, your, yeah. your individual. Oh, no, not to be yeah. not to be sued, but just like, hey, we're a fan of your games, and it's kind of fun that you have the name from our game. I just was waiting for some weird connection that way, but all right, apparently not. I was, <laughs> I was delighted one time uh, interviewing Mark Cerny. We were talking about you, and he's a big fan of Journey. And I was really tickled uh -huh. pink that Mark Cerny, of all people, was like, yeah, Genova, that's a Final Fantasy VII character, right? Like, he just happened to know that trivia. And it's like, I love the idea of Mark Cerny mm -hmm. knowing who Genova is in the game. That's so sweet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most people don't know. I mean, in my, I mean, I've been using this name ever since 15 years ago or something, when I first came to America. I think only, like, three people said, hey, I know Genova. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, nobody knows this name. Yeah. Do a lot of people say Jehovah? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, some people start to ask me the meaning of the name. And so I actually went back to do research why the name was originally created uh, by Square. And they were, I mean, to my surprise, I didn't understand the meaning back when I picked the name, but to my surprise, they were actually using Jehovah uh, but they want to kind of, you know, like, I guess it was a uh, gothic punk, right? Like, that's what that's what Final Fantasy is. So they want to, like, like, you know, kind of slay the gods, right? They, so they, they say Jehovah plus Nova, you know, which is the, you know, a new star is born, right? So right. it's like Jehovah. And I was like, wow, that's a very uh, blasphemy name. You know, like I didn't know that when I picked the name. So, uh, <laughs> And now you've had a full career of just blowing up the gods of gaming out there, man. <laughs> uh, that's what Kratos do. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's confusing. Yeah, the Sony Santa Monica connection, it's, it's a mess. Well, hey, uh, Sky, congratulations on the game finally coming out. Uh -huh. And now this is just, it's almost the start of your sprint, right? Now that you've made a living game, you're committed to this thing. Yeah, uh, so the game will be out in two days on iOS, and uh, uh, eventually it will come out to Android, PC, and console. Do you have any sort so, of timeline you can share with for any of those? Uh, well, I, I guess we will share with you when the date is becoming solidified, right? But uh, certainly, 
I think uh, there will be quite a few platform available this year. Quite a uh, few. Okay, so off of yeah. mobile this year. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Well, hey, congratulations to the team. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, man. Really nice appreciate talking it. to you. Absolutely. That was just a clip from a larger show called The Game Informer Show. You can find it on iTunes, Google Play, or GameInformer.com. We take the fun opportunities and exclusive information from Game Informer Magazine and boil it into a show that airs every Thursday with exclusive cover story information, developer interviews, a lot of fun stuff. So come love games with us.